there's different advice for different people at different levels of their journey, okay? Um, in self-help, it's great. You find out about things like social momentum is an example, right? It's like, hey, if I'm thinking a lot, if I just minimize time in between some interactions, uh, my mind won't have enough time to kick in. Does that work? Yeah, to a certain amount, but it never fixes the problem, right? You never get to the cause as to why is your mind kicking in and overthinking. You're just trying to battle it. The same with people who have social anxiety. Right? What's the traditional approach to social anxiety? Doing social anxiety challenges. Progressive desensitization. Will you temporarily feel a little bit more comfortable socially if you put yourself out there in different social anxiety situations and challenges? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. You put yourself in front of, say, if you're scared of public speaking, you go in front of a crowd, you do it enough, you'll desensitize yourself to it. But only to a certain amount and only as long as you keep doing it. As soon as you stop doing the challenges, what happens? You fall back to ground zero. So what's your solution? If you're like, well, I'm doing anxiety challenges every day. I hear people say that. I go out in the street and I do my little challenges and I talk to some people and I sing a song and people judge me and now I feel very free. I'm like, okay, well, you're gonna do that till you're 80? Is that your solution? To stay confident, you're gonna be like the 80-year-old grandparent, like, you're going out and do my challenges? No, it doesn't work. It only works so far, it never gets to the cause as to why do you have social anxiety to begin with, right? The same with you, with like consistency, self-sabotage, you feel like you keep being pulled back. People will tell you like, okay, well, you know, put good habits in place and different boundaries so you just don't have a choice. Yeah, but it never addresses that thing that just keeps pulling you back. Or you at the front, it's like, well, maybe I can force myself to drop the front or come up with techniques to be more, you know, it's like, no, why do you have the front? So, so much of self-help never gets to the cause, right? The same with, um, you know, things like affirmations. Oh, affirmations. I am awesome. I am awesome. D does that help? Okay. Now, you could say temporarily it could, but if a part of you deep down inside believes that you're not, it doesn't matter how many times you tell yourself you're awesome, you're still going to think that you're not. We all have that voice in the background like, I am great. No, you're not. I am great. No, you're not. But someone told me if I said it 200 times, maybe it would work. After 200 times, try it. That voice is still going to say, no, you're not after. Okay? It doesn't get to the cause. The biggest takeaway is you must get to the cause. Okay? Now, do these bits of advice, like I said, help temporarily? Yes, they help in a certain paradigm. And this is important. It's the difference between techniques and paradigms. Okay? Techniques versus paradigms. Paradigm, you could say, is the reality, the map, the situation, right? For example, here's a paradigm of you having social anxiety. In this paradigm, for someone who has social anxiety, does it help to do social anxiety challenges and to progressively desensitize themselves to it? Yes, right? But you're still in the paradigm of having it. The key is instead of looking for techniques within that paradigm, drop it and move to a paradigm where you just don't have social anxiety. And you don't need all those challenges and techniques. The same with someone who's stifled socially, right? You wanna know your ceiling of success when it comes to social interactions? As soon as you start freezing. I'm sure you've noticed this. If you talk to someone you feel like, ah, oh, we're in the same league or I'm a little bit outside their league, you don't run out of things to say. Right? You can talk and talk and talk. You can show your personality. You can be charismatic. You probably drop that front. But as soon as you talk to someone, you think, oh, they're a little bit above me, <gasps> you start freezing. In that paradigm of someone being stifled, does it help to look up techniques for how to never run out of things to say? Yes or no? Yeah. 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 Oh, what if I run out of things to say? What can I do? Oh, I can say this. But guess what? What about just not being stifled? and not even needing that technique of how to, no, how to not run out of things to say, because you just don't run out of things to say. And that's the thing, so many of us, we're looking for these techniques that entrench us in that paradigm. The same with affirmations, right? If you believe deep down inside, it's like, I'm not good enough, and then you try to convince yourself, I'm good enough, I'm good enough, I'm good enough. Is it better than nothing? Yeah, but it doesn't address that original cause, which is, wait, why do I believe I'm not good enough? Okay? The same with, I'm not confident. I need to work on my confidence to become confident. No. Will it help temporarily 
but it never gets to the cause. You want to know why? Because only someone who isn't confident is working on being confident. The more you work on being confident, this is also the catch, the more it entrenches you in that paradigm. The more you work on being confident, the more you tell yourself you're not confident. The more you try to convince yourself that I am great through affirmations, the more it's reinforcing that original assumption that you're not great. The more you work on these techniques to not run out of things to say, the more it reinforces that, hey, around this person you're stifled. The more you work on social anxiety challenges, the more you tell yourself, I have social anxiety. Okay, so you gotta catch yourself here. Techniques are great, and in every paradigm, there are certain techniques, and that's perfect. But if you've reached a point where you're going after technique, 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 and it's getting so overwhelming and complicated, because that's what happens. You start with a few basic ones, and it doesn't give you that result, so you just double down and double down and double down, and you're still not getting the result you're after, then guess what? It's not about techniques. It's about shifting paradigms and realities completely. Okay? And it is possible. We're like, what do you mean? You can shift to not having social anxiety? Yeah. But it also comes down to understanding what social anxiety really is, right? We treat it like a real fear. So much of social anxiety is simply you getting triggered. And this is important, okay? I'm sure you've heard that term, getting triggered, right? It's passed around everywhere. It's like <laughs> there's triggered memes and stuff. But if you think about it, what is getting triggered? It's when your response is disproportionate to reality. Okay, your buttons are being pushed. If I take you, you know, any of you, like <gasps> you, and I bring you up here in front, and I make you sing a song, you're probably gonna freeze. For a lot of people, public speaking is like close to death. They freeze, like, <gasps> and it's like sing, and they're like, <gasps> like, like freaking out. Now, is their response proportionate to reality? No. no. Is their life at risk? No. The same with a lot of social anxiety, right? I've seen it for years. It's like, hey, go say hi to that person. <sighs> Hanging on to me. And I'm like, come on, go say hi. And they're like, no. It's like, is their life at risk? I guess it depends where you live. But in most cases, no. Right? So it's a disproportionate response to the situation at hand. Now, to be clear, is there some realistic social anxiety. Yeah, you could say it's not necessarily 100% comfortable. There's situations where there are, oh, there's a little bit of pressure, but so much of the responses that people get, the reactions, is simply them getting triggered. And they treat that as if it's real. It's like, oh, go say hi. And they're like, well, that's a real fear. What can I do? And if you assume it's a real fear, and then you try to find techniques, what happens? It reinforces it, and you're stuck. Okay. So understand that whenever you're getting triggered, whenever your response is disproportionate to reality, it's because something inside of you that you've disowned is being poked at. Okay, so let's break this down, and this is key. You've heard me most likely talk about trauma a lot, right? And it's a big word, you hear it, you're like, wow, trauma, that's some serious stuff, right? Uh, you might look back at your childhood, your past, and you're like, well, I've had a pretty cushy past. No trauma there, right? A lot of people believe that. My past was pretty cushy too, right? Good family in Switzerland, loving parents still together. Do you think I had trauma? Yes or no? Yes. Of course, because everyone has trauma. And it comes down to understanding what is trauma. It's, of course, some big word, and we think, oh, trauma is like abuse and violence and stuff, and is that traumatic? Yes. But what we fail to realize is that trauma is anything that's just too overwhelming for us to handle, and that depends on the person and their perception of the world. As a kid, you don't know everything about the world. If you're lost in a grocery store, it could feel like you're about to die. That can be traumatic. As a kid, being told, hey, don't do that, can be traumatic. If you depend on your parents for survival, your parents saying don't do that, you interpret it as them yelling at you. If they yell at me, they don't love me, they could abandon me, I die. Traumatic. So we all experience trauma. It's part of the human condition, you could say. And what happens is when we experience it, in order to survive, we're going to disown either the experience altogether or a certain aspect of ourselves. 
right? If you were loud in school and the whole class shamed you or laughed at you, right? You might be like, this is the world. The whole classroom's the world. I'm going to die. So you take the part of you that's loud and it's like, never again. That's not me, right? Putting yourself out there socially, <gasps> let's never do that again. Social aspect to me, never. Loud, expressive, never. And we have this split inside. And then as you grow, there's layers and layers of resistance that get added to it. It compounds. And here you are in your adult life. Logically, if you look at the situation, no reason to freak out. Go say hi. Because <gasps> that part of you that you disowned back then gets poked at, gets triggered, and shoots up closer into your awareness. And the same survival instinct, the same <gasps> I'm going to die that you experienced when you disowned it resurfaces. And we treat that as real fear. Or, as soon as you get triggered, you try to desensitize yourself to it. And that's why it doesn't work. And people will say, well, you just got to live with it. It doesn't get better, but that's just how it is. No. Get to the cause, reown what's being poked at, and now guess what? Those situations don't push your buttons anymore. You're free from it. And you're left with the realistic, appropriate response to reality. You can do this audit with your life. Analyze your life. Where is my response disproportionate to reality? And you'll see small situations where you're just triggered, right? Someone cuts you off in traffic, and you're like, oh, and start going off. You're like, well, that was disproportionate to reality. There's one. For a lot of people, it's a breakup. They're run by a breakup years later. That's not an appropriate response to reality. You'll see people even remarry, right? Old people, they're like, my first wife is still triggered by it. <laughs> is it sad to go through a breakup? Of course, but not something that should ruin and run your life, right? The same with you sitting at home alone. For a lot of people, they just can't spend time with themselves because all that stuff starts bubbling up. That's not an appropriate response to reality. It's a subtle version of you getting triggered. And if you just look at your life like, huh, what if life didn't push my buttons? Suddenly possibilities open up and it's just like this very freeing view of the world. You're like, wow, I'd be so free. And it all comes from diving into this and processing and releasing what's getting poked at. Now that being said, doing social anxiety challenges, I personally love it. But my approach is very different. Most people do challenges to desensitize themselves. Instead, why not do challenges to proactively trigger yourself? Because when you're triggered, whatever is down there comes closer into your awareness. You could say, this is what you're aware of, this is what you're not aware of. Way down here is all the things you disowned. And it's a lot easier to catch up here than down there. Okay? So in what I teach with Transformation Mastery, it's action, trigger, release, repeat. That's the formula. You want to proactively be triggering yourself through action to then release whatever gets triggered and be free from it. So say you take social anxiety, you can do social anxiety challenges. Put yourself in situations and suddenly <gasps> the disproportionate response to reality kicks in. Great. Catch it. Let go of it. And repeat until you're free from it completely. This is what has personally gotten me those results I've been after for so long. Those results originally got me in to personal development, right? It's like a reality where you don't have social anxiety, a reality where you can express yourself, where there's no longer that fear, where you're no longer stifled and held back. You're like, that sounds great. And here you are still chasing it. And I remember it felt like, man, maybe that'll just never happen. It can if you get to the cause, okay? This here is also, as another side note, what keeps that front we put up alive, right? We all have a certain front. A lot of us feel like an imposter. Why? Because if there's all this stuff that you've disowned, you're hiding from, of course you're going to put up a front to compensate for it. And then you're afraid people will see through that front and see everything that is you. And then what we do is we try to optimize the front. You could say the ego. We try to get more validation to add more fuel and power to the front. And we're always walking around with that fear, like, oh, are people going to see me? Are people going to see me? Are people going to see me? Never truly getting to the cause. We talked about it before. It's like, you could say, this is what you're aware of. Okay, if you um, want to generalize how the mind works, this is the conscious mind. This is the subconscious. There's two worlds inside of you, you could say. 
And what we do is we only focus on the part of ourselves that we're aware of, the conscious mind. And we never release what's down here. Okay? You got to release what's in the subconscious. And it's about processing, not about using affirmations or trying to bullshit your subconscious. So key. That's like the bulldozer social anxiety version of this type of work. Okay? Key quote to remember, you cannot bullshit your subconscious. You cannot reframe your subconscious. You cannot negotiate with your subconscious. You cannot reason with your subconscious. You can only let go. Why? Because as we discussed, say, there's a part of you down here that's like, you know what? You don't deserve more than X amount in life. And as soon as you go above that, you self-sabotage. Well, what you might do is like, I deserve more. I deserve more. I deserve more. Positive affirmation. It's not going to work. Maybe if I analyze this belief and I reframe it, no. Because what happens if you reframe it, as we discussed before, you're still fueling it. You're still giving it power. Any action that's taken after that belief reinforces that original assumption, as we talked about before. It doesn't get to the cause. Instead, release it, and it's just gone. Make sense? Don't take the bulldozer approach. You can also view it like this. It's like, as we discussed, I'm not confident. I want to be confident. How can I get there? Any action taken away from this reinforces this is the starting point, reinforces that is the default. The same with a thought in your subconscious. I'm going to try to reframe this, keeps it alive. Instead, you want to identify all the things that have convinced you that it's alive, all the things that are maintaining that belief and let go of it, right? Um, my uh, good friend, his name is Buddy, it's actually true, he um, worked with uh, Jordan Belfort and uh, he was talking to Jordan about this and Jordan's actually super into spirituality and he might have gotten this from Tony Robbins but what he said is, if you take a belief, you can think about it as a table. All right, there's the table. For example, I'm not good enough, right? There's, and that's the belief. And what we try to do is, let's just say it's a very sturdy table, is we try to bang on it with a bat. And it just doesn't break, right? You bang, you bang, you bang. That's like someone saying, I'm gonna reframe this. I am good enough, oh, like that. Say it's like you, it's like, I'm afraid of other men. It's like, I'm not afraid. Yeah, it's not gonna work. Instead, Find the references or the things that are keeping this belief alive. Nuke the legs of the table, and then it's just gone. That's what we're doing here. Instead of say, I'm not good enough, now what? Wait a minute. What's keeping this I'm not good enough assumption alive? What are all the things that I bought into? Experiences, lies that are keeping it alive. And this is why you hear me talk so much about letting go. If you let go of all of this, you realize, oh, I've been good enough this whole time. And you just start with good enough. You enter that other paradigm as opposed to techniques. So with everything, it's the same as like social anxiety, desensitize, bang, bang, bang on the table. No. Why do I have social anxiety? Past traumatic experiences, assumptions, core beliefs. Nuke the legs out. Don't bang the table. You can bang the table all your fucking life. It's not going to work. Okay. And in terms of table banging too, <laughs> if, because this is what you probably get, it's like, oh, this makes sense. And then you're trying to consciously think of all the things that are keeping that belief alive. As we discussed here, the things that are keeping that belief alive are out of your awareness under layers and layers of resistance. To the point where even if you try to become aware of it now, it can be close to impossible, if not impossible. Super important. This is a classic self-help quote. There's what you know, there's what you know you don't know, and there's what you don't know you don't know. That's what runs us. And this is why you can use, for example, social anxiety challenges to trigger yourself. Because now you can find out, oh, something got poked at. It allows you to identify what you don't know you don't know. Okay. Another way you can identify what you don't know you don't know is through what I call shadow questions. Okay, 
What are shadow questions? You can think of them as probes that you send down here, and you see what answers get offered up to you. So here's an example. Imagine I were to ask you, why do you not deserve success? What's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear this? I do. What the fuck? What? Yeah, what do you mean? I, of course I do. And I'm not saying you don't. And that's the thing. With the shadow question, don't analyze the content of the question. Think of it as, I'm sending that probe down here. What gets offered up? Why don't I deserve success? And maybe that little voice is like, because you're ugly. We'll spit something up. Right? Great. Write that down. That's data. It's probes that give you the data of what's perhaps keeping you unsuccessful or stuck or self-sabotage alive. Okay, when it comes to self-sabotage too, by the way, there is no such thing. Same with like that consistency question. Whatever your life situation is right now, it's exactly what you want. Let this sink in. This is a game changer too. If you look at your life, including all the things you don't like about your life, you actually like them. But you're not aware of the part of you that does. Huge. Okay? You might hate right now that you haven't achieved a certain level of success. You're like, no, it's not true. I want to be more successful. BS. You actually don't. Or you would be. Self-sabotage is you getting exactly what you want, but you're not aware of it. So here's an example. If down here, there's a belief that it's like, you know, you suck for what you did in the past, and you might have buried it. You might not even think about it consciously. And here you are trying to become successful and you keep self-sabotaging. It could just be because that part of you is like, nope, we can't let us be successful or we wouldn't get the punishment we deserve. If there's a belief, for example, it's like, you know, success is scary, success is bad, success is a lot of responsibility, success is not for me, then of course you're going to self-sabotage to stay congruent to it. The same with your whole core identity. If you think, I am a loser, and it's ingrained in you, and you've been acting from that your entire life, you will do whatever it takes to stay congruent to that. That's your ultimate comfort zone. If I am loser, I can't get success, or I'm no longer loser. And consciously, you might be like, I want it, but you're gonna keep pushing it away. And with self-sabotage, there's what you catch, but most of it, you're not even aware of it. Okay, um, one other way to view it, by the way, with self-sabotage, linking it to your question, is um, here, here's an approach, another bulldozer, hammer on the table approach. Say this is you. Okay. And this is success. And you're trying to go there consciously. You're like, that's what I want. And you know the action steps. However, inside of you, there's a little, this is my horrible drawing, demon, right? A little demon in you. And that demon's saying, nah, you know what? Failure. Let's go there. And it's like this tug of war. People experience this whenever you say, like you said, I'm going to do it for 30 days, I'm going to do this and do the good habits, and eventually you get pulled back. It's like this invisible force inside of you. People do it with New Year's resolutions to the point where it's now this joke. No one takes it seriously. Like, of course you're going to give up New Year's resolutions. No one sticks to it. So we do temporary sprints. And we all have this force inside of us that pulls us back. And what we try to do is we're like, hey, let's discipline this. Willpower, work ethic, discipline. That part of me that keeps pulling me towards failure, let's just whip it into shape. That's work ethic. Does it get to the cause? No. You know what it does? Just makes that little demon even more mad. Instead, what about identifying the part of you that is pulling you here, identifying why, what's keeping this alive, letting go of it, so that there then is no more demon, and you're just aligned and pulled towards success. Instead of having this tug of war, why not just align everything? Instead of work ethic, cultivate a work magnet. Screw work ethic, that's just you beating yourself up, addicting yourself to self-hate, a horrible experience of the present moment. 
Okay? So, back to the shadow questions. Okay, sending those probes down there. Five that I would highly recommend you ask yourself and reflect on are the following. One, as we discussed, why is success not for me? And I would challenge you to write down what comes up. Okay, a form of resistance is, oh, I'll think about it, and it just keeps it very vague. If you write it down, it makes it real, you see it, and you have to be precise because you're putting it into words. Why is success not for me? And go past the autopilot response, it is, I know, don't now is the question, ask yourself, is there a part of me that might believe success is not for me? Number two, why am I not good enough? Am I saying you're not good enough? Of course not. But analyze and just see what comes up. You gotta open yourself up to these answers. It's identifying what is running you so you can then let go of it. Why am I not good enough? Number three, what am I hiding? What am I hiding? What am I afraid people will see? Number four, why does life have to be hard for me? Why does life have to be hard? And number five, why do I hate myself? Now, when you hear this, these shadow questions, um, especially if you're on the affirmation, reason with your subconscious, try to BS your subconscious, there's a lot of resistance. Why? Because it's like, well, that's focusing on the negative. Have you heard about that? If you focus on the negative, what's going to happen? You're going to probably attract more negative. Anyone hear of the law of attraction? Yeah. But here's the thing, and this is what blocks people. All those things that you're now focusing on that were out of your awareness, whether you're aware of them consciously or not, they are currently active and have been active and have been attracting things in your life, right? We think that law of attraction only applies to what we're aware of, the thoughts we're aware of. No, the law of attraction applies to also the thoughts that you're not aware of. And this is why, if you look at a traditional spiritual law of attraction gathering, they're all broke as fuck. Right? It's like, oh, you're, you're trying to manifest things with your positive thinking? How's that going? And it's all these, like, honestly, just broke people attracting horrible things. Why? Because they never address the subconscious, the world they're not aware of. Okay? If you want it more simplified, you can view it like this. What you're aware of, what you're not aware of, and the split. Two worlds inside of you. And people just focus on this. I'm good enough. I'm going to keep focusing on good things. But down here, it's like, no, you're not. That's still active. Here, sending the probe, you're becoming aware of it so you can let go of it and free yourself from it. The things that run you are out of your awareness. If you were aware of them, you could do something about it and it'd be done. Okay, another key quote. The solutions are out of your awareness. How can you become aware of them? That's the first step of the process. I do this at Transformation Mastery Live and in the mentoring is um, a death meditation, which I would highly recommend looking into where you sink into the perspective that you died and you audit your life from that perspective. Now, why might a process like that be helpful? Well, if you go back to this, okay, you stuff this down here, you make that split inside, you disown it in order to survive, correct? That's why it's down there and why there's layers and layers of resistance. When you're triggered, it's that same survival instinct that kicks in. If you're able to do a death meditation and convince yourself that you actually died and from that perspective reflect back on your life, then guess what? These layers of resistance fade away a bit. If you're keeping this out of your awareness to survive and you convince yourself you're dead, you no longer have to keep them out of your awareness, right? Does this make sense? Yeah. Or is this too, everyone's like, what? Yeah. It's like, oh, I don't have to lie to myself. I don't have to keep this split alive. And people are surprised and astonished by the data that comes up that they can then let go of. 
Okay. But this model, this map, is the way to go about it. So here's a paradigm. I'm not charismatic, now what? And in that paradigm, advice like, again, what's the bulldozer advice? Speak louder, develop you know, your social skills, learn this, articulate more, so on and so forth. It's like bulldozing through. But it's still the assumption that you're not loud and that you're shy. And it requires a lot of effort, right? That's another good way of viewing it. It's like, it's just so much effort, kind of like, with, it's like you reach that point where it's like too much effort. Instead of saying, I'm not charismatic, now what? It's, hey, what if I am charismatic, but there's just things blocking it from coming out? Identify the blockage, release it, and you no longer have to make yourself be loud, you're just loud, right? That's the approach. Um, the other classic one that, this one is a, a quote that I came up with myself, credit goes to me, I'm very proud of it, and it blows people's minds. People here, fake it till you make it, right? But that's not true. Fake it till you make it, what's, again, the whole approach here? Examine the assumption. It's assuming that you're being real right now. What if you're being fake right now? What if you being stifled is you being fake? Instead of fake it till you make it, it's act real until you remember. That was me, that was daddy's, okay? <laughs> And that's the thing, it's like, I'm not charismatic, and we assume that that's us being real, instead of saying, wait a minute, that's just me being stifled. If I identify all the things that's stifled, I release it, then I can unleash that charisma. It shouldn't require effort. Okay? Are techniques still involved? Say you're making a sale, or there's a certain goal. Of course there are some, but that's just like 10 to 15%. Most of the techniques that people get sucked into in socializing are reinforcing, again, that wrong assumption. It's compensating techniques. And that's what you want to let go of. That'll do more harm than good in the long run. This is the scale of transformation. You could say the natural process of transformation. And it also reconciles a lot of this different advice for different paradigms. Okay, so here you have apathy, grief, Fear, anger, courage, desire, purpose, love. These four here are the competitive states. And as you move above, courage and up, it's the collaborative states. So what does this mean? Okay. Apathy is a state of, you could say, resistance, withdrawal, ultimately just giving up. Whether it's in terms of your goals, in terms of feeling, in terms of life itself. Okay. It's like, what's the point? Can't make it anyway. Screw it, whatever. And we all have pockets of this, okay? If you look at this scale, we each have a habitual state where we reside in the most. You're like, oh yeah, that's totally me. Fear, that's totally me. Anger, that's totally me. Oh, desire, that's totally me. You know, grief, this is more victimhood. Ah, that's totally me. But then we all have pockets of the rest. For example, you might be courage in most areas of life, but when it comes to relationships, you're in apathy. Eh, what's the point? Or health, you're in apathy. So this is the lowest level, someone who's kind of given up. As you move up, you get into victimhood, okay? Where instead of being like, ah, what's the point? It's, ah, uh, I could, but this thing happened, that person happened, this situation, this thing might pass, so on and so forth. All the excuses. As you move up, you tap into more power and more energy. So for someone who's in apathy, Telling them that they're a victim is actually amazing advice. It goes against mainstream thing. You're like, what do you mean? Tell someone they're a victim? Yeah, if someone who's completely given up, like, what's the point? You're like, hey, it's not your fault. It's the government. What? <laughs> There's a little bit more hope, right? It's still very disempowering, but it's a lot now. It's like, oh, so I could if that person or that thing or the government did do it. It's not like, regardless, I can't, whatever. It's I could, but, okay? and you move up into grief victimhood. Now, is this a state you wanna stay in? Of course not. When you're in grief victimhood, that's when you need what I call the harsh talk. The put your foot down, stop being a little bitch, step it up. Take responsibility. If you say take responsibility to someone who's in apathy, it's gonna crush them, right? So we're gonna break down each level, but just real fast, three rules with this. We all have a habitual state and we all have pockets. This represents the sequence of transformation. People fail 
because they don't understand the sequence. Okay, so for example, say you experience anger, you might think that's bad, but that's not true. If you're coming from fear, experiencing anger is good. If you're coming from courage, it isn't. So it's not this linear feel good, feel good, feel good journey. Here you have the map. The other mistake people make is they try to aim too high. They try to go from apathy to anger, grief all the way to purpose. And of course you're not gonna make it, and then they, they, they fail. And the other thing is for each level, there's different advice. Like I said, for apathy, hey, you're a victim. Once you're in a victim, stop being a bitch. But you don't say that to someone who's in apathy. There's different advice for each level, and what people do is they use the wrong advice for where they're at. Okay? So here it's stop being a bitch. Take responsibility. <gasps> Move into fear. Okay? Or stop being a bitch. Be pissed at yourself. Say fuck you to that victim. Move into anger. Now is this where you want to reside long term? No. Say you hit anger, and now it's time to forgive. But if you say forgive to someone who's in victimhood, it'll just reinforce like, oh yeah, forgive, eh, that little disempowering state. When you forgive, you shift into courage. Here, you could say it's the competitive states. It's the playing not to lose. It's also you versus the world, right? It's, here, it's me versus the world, fuck it. That's apathy, what's the point? Grief is me versus the world, poor me, I'm a victim. Here, it's me versus the world, <sighs> gotta protect myself, ah, <sighs> other people, right? I can see the guys, me versus the world. Here, it's me versus the world, fuck the world, I'm gonna get mine, I'm gonna get even, I'm gonna do something about it. But it's still you versus the world. With each one, there's more power. You can also take more action as you move up, right? Being anger, like, fuck, not again, that's a lot more energy and power to take action than say, oh, poor me. Same with fear, <gasps> fear. That's more energy, more power than grief or apathy. As you let go of the competitive states, you move into courage. And that's where instead of playing not to lose, me versus, again, not to lose, it's what is my win? What is winning? Most people have no idea. They just live their lives like, oh, just play not to lose. It's like, you're here till you die, what do you want to do? I don't know, whatever my parents, society, friends, whatever gets me away from these things, play not to lose. What's playing to win? What's your win? So here you discover that. But it tends to be like plain, t like a small wins. Like you settle for less, a little win here and there. It's still a little bit dabbly, a little bit procrastinating. Then what you can do here is you can actually aim temporarily for desire. If you're always just kind of dabbling around, right? You can think of this as like the, the stick states, like carrot and stick. You let go of the stick. Now you can amplify the carrot. Paint the desire, right? What I say here in terms of motivation, if you're at courage, is write out your higher self-motivation and your lower self-motivation towards whatever your win is. Higher self could be change the world. Lower self could be to prove everyone wrong and get approval. I'd recommend doing that with all your goals, by the way. So key, right? We think we're the exception. We overestimate ourselves. We think we're gonna be in this high, blissful state all the time. No. What about when you're in a petty state? How can you still go towards your win? What will happen too with desire is sometimes you'll get a couple bit of wins and then the ego will kick in and you'll start selling out on your authentic win and deviate from money, approval, so on and so forth. Then it's time to let go of that. And as you do, you align with purpose. Instead of acting from a place of desperation, you act from a place of inspiration. And then of course, there is love where it's the state of acceptance and embracing all. But this is really the process, okay? Um, this is the map that I use. This is the map that um, is ultimately the culmination of like all my years in transformational work, okay? And ideally you wanna reach a point, and this is um, what I teach people in the mentoring that I do. I take them through each one. So you reach a point where it's like, I view it like this tool belt that you have, all right? We think love, this is another little nuanced point, um, we think that the ultimate goal of love, so on and so forth, is like enlightenment, right? This state where you'll never feel, you know, any kind of anger or fear, so on and so forth, but that's not true. That's, if you believe in that, you've been sold on a dream. Um, that is, fortunately, a belief that less and less people buy into. Um, it was kind of imposed on people from the old school, you could say, 70s, 80s self-help movement or spiritual movement, right? What's the spiritual movement of the 80s? 
You come up in like this robe and you're like, I'm enlightened. I know the secrets of the universe. I feel, I've transcended all my feelings, right? I transcended fear, I transcended it all. I'm in a non-dual state. You want to be like me? Pay me money. That's the approach. And then we do, we're like, oh, I want to be like that. And as soon as we experience some fear, we're like, oh, I'm experiencing fear, I haven't transcended it. Thank God that's gone. What's the goal here? Instead of, hey, hating your emotions even more to the point where you want to transcend them and ultimately numb yourself from feeling, what about changing the relationship you have with feeling and loving every emotion? A state of love, you still experience fear, anger, so on and so forth, but it's appropriate to the situation. You've released the triggeredness around it, and you actually enjoy it, right? If you didn't experience fear, you'd die. You should experience fear. Same with anger. It's valuable. But what we do is we've been conditioned to have such a toxic relationship with our emotions, right? When we experience fear, we start hating that we experience fear, and we self-attack over it. And then we feel worse because of the self-attack, and then we self-attack over self-attacking. We feel bad about feeling bad about feeling bad about feeling bad. What if someone told you from the moment you're born, hey, Experiencing fear is awesome. Or experiencing grief is awesome. How would, what would your experience of the thing would change? Imagine, from a very young age, everyone's been telling you, hey, fear is the shit. That's when you're the most attractive, it's the best, and you see all these YouTube videos and courses on how to experience more fear, and it's like, hey, here's it. What would happen? You'd experience fear, you'd be like, yes, right? That's the state of love, is you change your relationship with it all. But ultimately, it's like you have a tool belt. Things will happen, things will throw you in different pockets, and you know exactly what tools to use, what level to aim for, don't aim too high, just aim for the next one up, and how to move out of it fast. You're equipped for life, okay? This is the map. And ultimately, apart from the tools for each level, the way you move up is through letting go. Okay, and any stinging point, anything you're dealing with is linked to one of these levels. I'm sure you've heard of the term RAS, right? RAS, Reticular Activating System. If not, Google that. If you're not aware of this, your life will be very limited and you'll be stuck a lot. RAS, it's basically your selective focus, right? Right now we're all in this same physical reality, but our experience and perception of it is very different. Okay? You can't take it all in at once. If you all close your eyes right now, as an ex example, close your eyes, and with your eyes closed, I ask you, what is red in this room? Red. I want 10 things that are red in this room. Open your eyes. What's happening now? Red has value, so you're zoning in on it. Okay? Now here is what happens. These states that we can find ourselves in will hijack our RAS, your selective focus. Say you're in a state of fear, and you're sitting in this room in a state of fear. You're gonna experience this room very differently than other people. You're gonna be filtering it through, where are the threats? Are people judging me? Are people staring at me? What's going on? Is Julian gonna call me out? Is he gonna call me up front? Oh, what's the exercise? What's gonna happen? What about this? Oh, maybe I shouldn't have come here. Oh my God, like fear, right? And you'll actually look for proof to reinforce it, and that'll reinforce it. It's this endless feedback loop. If you're in a state of anger, it's the same thing. You'd be like, I'm here. Uh, is this, is the, the, the mic's not even working? What kind of event is this? It's a little cold, which, by the way, if any staff, we can bring it a little warmer in here. It's, a, it's, it's very cold, right? Uh, this is pissing me off. It's so cold. And that's the reality you're in, okay? So these states hijack your focus. You can view it as like glasses, sunglasses, and you filter reality through it, and it reinforces the lens. You can think of the lens just getting thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker until it's just you. Now, that is how I your RIS, and that's also what we call blind spots. You will block off things that actually help you. Here's some examples of blind spots. I had a client, this is um, back in Amsterdam, back in 2010. Um, we went out to work on his social skills, and he was doing amazingly well, right? Everyone he talked to, smiling, loving him. End of the night, I'm like, hey, let's, uh, let's you know, talk about it, break it down. That was a great night, man. And he's like, what do you mean? It sucked. I'm like, whoa, what, what happened? He's like, everyone hated me. I'm like, no, they didn't. They all loved you. He's like, no, not a single person liked me. I'm like, did you not see them smiling? They're like, no, they all hated me. That was his reality. 
Next day, same thing happened. Great night, everyone loving this guy. And he would leave sometimes, like, why did you leave? They hated me. I'm like, no, they didn't. Third night, I'm like, not this time. And I had a friend of mine go in and start taking pictures of the people he's talking to, smiling, loving him. End of the night, he's like, they hated me again. I'm like, look at this. And he couldn't believe it. He was like, what? Blind spots. Okay, crazy how that works. So that's one example. Here's another one. We talked about self-sabotage, how oftentimes you can't even catch the self-sabotage. Say you're someone who has very low self-esteem. And someone goes up to you, just a very simple example, and compliments you on something. Like, hey, nice shoes. Someone with low self-esteem, are they going to see that as a compliment? Or are they going to have a blind spot to it and perhaps filter it as a sarcastic remark? Right? Nice shoes. Now, fuck that person mocking my shoes. <laughs> Crazy. Now, as you move up, say you're mid-level, someone might say, nice shoes. And you'll still see it as a compliment, but then you won't be able to let it land. And you'll be like, oh, these shoes, they're nothing. And then as you move up, nice shoes, thank you. That's just a compliment, right? So that's what I'm saying. Self-sabotage that you catch is like you hear the compliment, but you can't let it land, so you have to downplay it. Oh, they're nothing. What about all the self-sabotage you don't even see? Blind spot too, just like someone seen that as an insult when it was a compliment. Opportunities you just filter out, okay? The same with um, things we have invested a lot of, say, energy in. If there's a certain approach, right, or a certain belief or a certain method you've invested a lot in, um, you're not going to want to go back on it. So you're gonna filter out things that challenge it. Um, people do this when they filter you know, information to say, help them, they look for information that reinforces what they know and adds something more advanced on it to reinforce and make them feel good, as opposed to looking for challenging information. Okay, um, so blind spots are key. We have it towards ourselves, towards our beliefs, and until you get like external feedback to point it out, it's very tough to catch on your own. This is why it's so crucial to get coaches Okay? To surround yourself with people who will call you out on your shit. To surround yourself with a council of opposing views, not a yes man or yes person chamber. Okay? Um, this is another big mistake. People hear like, you know, don't be around negative, toxic people. And then they surround themselves with people who disagree with whatever they say. Thinking that disagreement is toxic and bad. No. Surround yourself with all types of people. And go where it's triggering, go where it's challenging. A coach without a coach is like a doctor who won't go to the doctor. It's like everyone does it. You know, no one's above the process. It's, you just got to surrender to it, right? Most people will be like, I will figure it out on my own. That's the biggest mistake too. Don't try to figure it out on your own. I didn't. I admitted to myself, by the way, two things that I'm so grateful for. When I first started out, I admitted to myself how lame, stupid, and ignorant I was, for real. I didn't think I was above it. And I was able to seek help while simultaneously taking responsibility. Those were the two things that really, really helped me. So what does that mean? It's like, acknowledge you're too stupid. People think they can figure it out. And again, if this is you, reflect on this. If you could, you would have. If you could do it on your own, you would have done it by now. You wouldn't be here. So put your pride aside. Put your ego aside and be like, you know what? I'm too dumb. Um, I'm too weak. I don't have the energy, the willpower, the discipline, the work ethic, or the work magnet to do it on my own. I need help. And we think that asking for help is a massive sign of weakness. It isn't. The sign of weakness is like, I, was like, I don't need help. And then they say stuck. I'd much rather surrender and be like, help me and just get there. Right? Um, I actually make people sign this. Um, in my uh, mentoring, there's like a commitment letter you have to sign, and one is asking for help is not a fucking sign of weakness. And it's crazy how people will go back later on in the week and they're like, hey, thank God you made me sign that because I had resistance to asking this question, resistance to asking that. We're just conditioned this way. It's like, oh, it's weakness. Like, no, ask for help. That's how you get good. Whatever it is you're after, someone has done it before you. Pay that person and have them help you get there. Why waste time? You could die any day, right? So ask for help, pay for help, surround yourself with people who always give you feedback, don't do it alone. And then the other thing is, like I said, 
ask for help while simultaneously taking responsibility, meaning that I would ask someone for help, but then I wouldn't wait for them to do it for me. And I wouldn't place the responsibility of my success in their hands. Now this is tough for people because they're like, well, if I ask them for help and I pay them for help, do the fucking work. <laughs> But that's not how it works. People who do that, they say stuck. It's another form of, you could say, victim mentality. It's what I was telling you. It's like, no, you've got to start also thinking for yourself. It's a balance, right? I would pay people for help, ask them for help, and then everything on my shoulders. It's in my control, my responsibility. I'm going to do it. I'm not going to wait or put it on them. If you can balance that, you fucking slay. Okay? And then it's also not waiting for a magical moment. Um, I've talked about this in a lot of videos where People think that they're not successful because they haven't hit that tipping point. There is no tipping crazy point where suddenly success happens. It's all gradual. You're either moving up or you're moving down. Don't wait for that magical moment. Jump in now and just take those right actions. You know, it's what I said. It's a very simple process yet difficult to execute on. You look at so many people who've made it, they always tell you the same thing. Hey, pay for advice, jump in, take responsibility, so on and so forth. And we're like, I can do it differently. No, just surrender and do the fucking thing, right? All the energy we spend trying to fight the process or tweak it to us because we think it's different for us, that's what keeps you stuck. If you were just like, I am like everyone else. There's nothing different or unique or special about me. I will surrender and do what they tell me to say, yet get ahead. I'm sure you've heard of a seminar high, right? It's like, ah, oh, you feel great, and then it didn't last. It's not meant to last. The thing is, people use it the wrong way. They, they try to make this seminar high last as opposed to using it for what it's for. A seminar high is a temporary, uh, temporary parting of the clouds, where it's like you're stuck in your way of doing things. Any type of thinking in your current way of doing things will reinforce it. A seminar high is boom, you've taken perspective. You're like, oh wow, you're in a higher state. And from that higher state, you use it to make key decisions, to place boundaries in your life, so that when you fall back in the derp state, boom, you go in the right direction. Think of it like this. You're, a little bit of genius from me to you. Say you're this um, spinning ball of derp, okay? And spinning ball of derp is just going right down into fucking hell, into failure. You get a seminar high. So you snap out, and you're up here, okay, two eyes, and you're like, holy shit, I'm going right down there. Now people try to maintain it. I want to stay up here. That's not going to happen. You're going to go right back into the ball of derp. But here's what you can do. From this perspective, you can place boundaries. So you see the trajectory. Say you put a fucking wall here. Now when you go back, you go here. Or you put a wall here, so when you fall back, you go right up to success. That's what you use a, a, this, this for. It's like, oh shit, that's what I'm doing. I know I'm gonna fall back. What can I do so that when I fall back, I don't keep going in that direction, All right? How can I put myself in a situation so that even when I fall back, I'm moving up.